Calista and I are thrilled to be here. It is always great to be back in Hamilton County. Uh, this is, you know, this is one of the great Republican counties in American history. It's a, it's a remarkable uh, how many strong leaders you've produced over the years. Uh, you can be very proud of your current senator, uh, who's doing a great job, and Rob Portman represents, I think, part of that kind of experience. You can also be very proud of a long tradition of electing people. I uh, want to say, I think the key to this whole election is to recognize how big a choice we're going to make this fall. Four more years of Barack Obama. You get it, OK? But in, but in all seriousness, if you have the level of unemployment we've had, and the current number is understated because we've had at least four percentage points drop out and no longer look for work. So the way they measure unemployment, if you're not looking, you're not unemployed, although you're out of work. So the out of work number is dramatically higher than the unemployed number. And of course, from the Obama standpoint, they really like the lower numbers, so they're glad people quit looking because otherwise the unemployment number would be about 12 to 15 percent. Uh, and uh, that's why I've said over and over again this is the best food stamp president in American history. Uh, to give you an example of choice, I'm running because I'd like to be the best paycheck president in American history. The choice for us is very clear. And I think I can illustrate it in a very simple way. I'm going to ask a couple questions. How many of you agree that Washington is very badly on the wrong track? Yeah. And how many of you would agree that in addition to defeating Obama, we need even more changes in the bureaucracy, the laws, the Congress, that it's more than just the Oval Office, but to really fix things, we have to have a big scale of change. And how many of you would agree that in that big scale of change, even if we win the election decisively, which I think we can, the, the left will fight us every single day in order to try to stop us. And it'll be just like Wisconsin, where they're now trying to recall the governor because they don't want to concede anything. Now, in that setting, the, the central question we as Republicans have to ask is who can carry a campaign of really large-scale change? Because if you really want to change Washington, well, you've come up with the right answer, I'll tell you that. But, but think about it. But what we don't want to do, and, and this has been the central argument with Governor Romney, I don't think that a moderate can defeat Obama because they don't have enough space to debate. I think if you look at, at Romney care and Obamacare, they're too similar. And if you look at his record as governor, they're too similar. For example, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the Obama administration's attack on the Catholic Church. Well, the fact is Governor Romney insisted that Catholic hospitals give out ab abortion pills against their religious belief when he was governor. So you have a very similar pattern again. Over and over, you get the same pattern. And I think that a Massachusetts moderate finds it very hard to draw a sharp contrast with somebody who's an Illinois radical. Now, by contrast, when Calista and I made the decision to run, it was precisely because we believed that there was an opportunity to have the kind of national campaign that was a real conversation about the future and that allowed people to see a real choice about how big the difference could be. So, for example, I believe that we need to fundamentally rethink the tax code with one goal in mind, to be the most powerful, most successful, job-creating uh, country in the world. And to do that, I think you've got to do a couple of very bold things. I think you have to have zero capital gains tax so that hundreds of billions of dollars will pour into the United States in order to create new jobs, create new businesses, put people to work, make us competitive once again with China and India. Second. I, I think you need to have 100 percent expensing. That means with, whether you're a farmer or a doctor or a factory or whatever, if you buy new equipment, this, this restaurant, 
If you buy new equipment, you write it off in one year. And the reason is simple. We want American workers to have the most modern equipment in the world so that they can compete and be productive, and they can be more productive than Chinese or Indian workers. It's a very deliberate strategy. Now, in that process, we also want to fundamentally change unemployment for practical reason. If we're going to have the most modern machinery in the world, we have to have the best trained workers in the world. So I would modify unemployment compensation to say, if you need it, you can get it. But in order to get it, you have to sign up for a business-based training program so you are learning a new skill during the period where we're giving you money. It is fundamentally wrong to give people uh, 99 weeks of money for doing nothing. Just, just think, think about the consequences. In 99 weeks, you can earn an associate degree. I mean, that's how big the difference is. So now we're going to modernize the equipment, and we're going to modernize the workforce so we can compete with anybody. I'd also reduce the corporate income tax to 12.5%. That's the Irish level. It will do three things. First, it will liberate $700 billion that is currently tied up overseas because they won't bring it home at a 35% range. So you'd automatically have more money coming home to be reinvested. Second, it lets American companies compete anywhere in the world. At 12.5%, we actually have a lower tax rate than, than Canada, for example. Third, I tell my liberal friends, it actually means that General Electric would pay taxes. Because when you lower the rate enough, they lay off the tax lawyers and write the check. Because it's less expensive to just write the check. We also would abolish the death tax so that no family would ever again be punished for working hard, doing everything right. You know, when, when, when it turned out that Governor Romney paid about 15 percent, liberals promptly said, oh, he should pay a lot more. Well, I'm a conservative. I, we have a proposal that you have the option to either keep the current tax code, all the deductions, all the paperwork, or you can choose a one-page flat tax. You fill in, here's how much I earned, here's how many dependents, I'm paying 15 percent. We want you to have the Romney 15 percent rate as a flat tax option uh, for, or keep the current code. You get to choose which one you like. This is, a, this is a system, this system has been used in Hong Kong for 40 years. And the result would be that for most Americans, there would be less paperwork, less confusion, and a lower tax rate. Now, the establishment in Washington will tell you that that's not revenue neutral. And they're right. It's called a tax cut. <laughs> and a tax cut cannot be revenue neutral. On the other hand, here's my principle. I want to shrink Obama's spending down to the level of revenue, not raise your revenue to catch up with his spending. <laughs> One of the ways in which I strongly disagree with the Republican establishment. I am not running to be the tax collector for Obama's credit card. I am running to cut up the credit card and reduce government spending so that we actually have a country that's dynamic and that's growing. And frankly, there are two ways to dramatically increase government revenue. The first is to have a full employment economy. When I left the speakership, I'd had two phases of helping create jobs, one with Ronald Reagan, where through tax cuts and regulatory reform and focusing on American energy, we created 16 million new jobs in an eight-year period. The other was working with Bill Clinton, where in four years' time with welfare reform, two out of three people went to work or went to school, cutting spending, only the second time since World War II, uh, cutting taxes. We ended up creating 11 million new jobs. Unemployment, I mean, the unemployment rate dropped to 4.2 percent. Well, if you took the real unemployment number today with all the people who aren't looking for work. And so you actually created enough jobs to actually bring the real unemployment number down to 4.2 percent. That's all the people you're taking off of food stamps, off of Medicaid, 
off of public housing, off of unemployment compensation. That all saves the government money. That means over here, they're all now working and paying taxes and taking care of their families. So government revenue goes up while government spending goes down. That was the basis for four consecutive years of a balanced budget. So we can do it. But there's a second gigantic potential source. I just did a radio show on the way over here in North Dakota. In North Dakota today, they're developing the Bakken field and they're producing so much oil that they have 3.5% unemployment and they've had seven consecutive... <laughs> that is a phrase that I helped popularize with Sean Hannity, so... Uh, you know, we both did a petition drive on Drill Here, Drill Now, Pay Less. We wrote a book of that name, and Callista and I actually made a movie called We Have the Power. So I'm very fond of uh, Drill Here, Drill Now, Pay Less, and it does work. Here are two things to remember about North Dakota, where they've had seven consecutive state tax cuts because so much money's coming in from this energy. If that had been public land, it would not have been developed. Just think about it. North Dakota is unique because the oil is on private land and therefore they could actually do it without the government stopping them. There's a second thing to remember. Because the U.S. Geological Survey studies are 30 years old, all the technology was obsolete. Today in North Dakota, the estimate is that there is 25 times more oil, not 25 percent, 2,500 percent more oil than the U.S. Geological Survey thought there was. Now, what does that say? It means if we were to develop all of our federal assets, remember, we own 69 percent of Alaska. We own 85 percent of Nevada. If we were to develop our federal lands and develop our offshore capabilities, we would generate so much energy that no American president would ever again bow to a Saudi king. And what would the result of all that extra revenue be? It means that the federal government would earn royalties out of all the developments. And what I'd like to see us do is set up a pattern where two-thirds of all the new royalties goes to deficit reduction and one-third goes to infrastructure building so that we can actually have an infrastructure rebuilt to enable us to be competitive with China and India uh, so that we have the most modern infrastructure in the world. I mean, these are the kind of practical solutions that we can do if we're prepared as a country to go out and do them. I also want to dramatically modernize the federal government. Uh, we believe that you could save at least $500 billion a year just by having a more modern government, that the, the bureaucracy, the red tape, uh, the regulatory process, the whole way the civil service works today really inhibits us. Uh, the example I like to use is, is I describe it as the world that works and the world that fails. A uh, very simple model. How, how many of you have ever gone online to track a package at UPS or FedEx? Just raise your hand if you've ever done that. Okay. So this is not a theory, right? Now, I say that because when you go to Washington, their eyes glaze over. I mean, they keep going, why does Gingrich talk about all these strange ideas? And I keep trying to convince them, this is called the real world. Okay? So, so, so you actually have a system today, right, where 24 million packages a day can be tracked in real time on your computer at no extra cost. That's over here. That's the world that works. Now, over here is the federal government, which cannot today find 11 million illegal immigrants if they're sitting still. <laughs> so one of my proposals is that we send a package to every person who's here illegally. <laughs> And then when they get the package, we pull up the computer, we know where they are. <laughs> now, for the fact checkers and news media, that was hyperbole. I didn't actually mean it. Uh, but it illustrates, doesn't it illustrate a key point, though? We, we, we talked to American Express, Visa, and MasterCard, and, and the best estimate we can get is if they ran Medicare and Medicaid so that they used their anti-fraud systems, we would save between 60 and $110 billion a year that currently goes to crooks. Yeah. 
We actually wrote a book called Stop Paying the Crooks, which we thought might be clear enough that it would get through in Washington, but it didn't. Uh, but it's the same principle. I mean, the government is such an incompetent administrator of your money that we literally believe somewhere between 60 and $110 billion a year is siphoned off by crooks in Medicare and Medicaid loans, not counting food stamps, not counting student loans. Uh, I mean, in South Florida today, professional criminals tell each other it is safer and more profitable to steal from Medicare and Medicaid than it is to sell cocaine. And so you've actually had a migration into organized professional theft because the government's so incompetent. So I think we can have a dramatic resurgence. Our goal, if I, if I could summarize it in a simple way, our goal is to unleash the American people so that they can go out and rebuild the country we love. And that means getting the federal government dramatically out of the way, applying the Tenth Amendment, returning power back home, allowing you to make a lot more decisions in your life. Now, to make this practical, with your help, if we win the Ohio primary, and uh, there was a poll out this morning that I'm ahead by a tiny margin. So, we need, we need your help to make it a bigger margin. But if we win the primary and we go on to win the nomination, then I want to run as a team this fall. My good friend, your former Congressman Bob McEwen is here, and Bob can tell you, Bob can tell you that we were very successful, both in 1980 in organizing the first Capitol Steps event with Governor Reagan, where we brought House and Senate candidates together, and in, two, in 1994, when we got 350 candidates to come together to pledge the contract with America. We got the largest one-party increase in American history, 9 million new votes. It made a huge difference. Um, we can do it this year. If we do it this year, with your help, we will. Here's what I want us to campaign on this fall. I'll ask every candidate for the House and Senate to agree that when they get sworn in on January 3rd, they will stay in office. They will pass the repeal of Obamacare immediately. They will pass the repeal of the Dodd-Frank bill, which has been killing small banks, killing small business. And they will pass the repeal of Sarbanes-Oxley, which has been adding cost to, go to business without adding any, any useful information. Those three steps we would like to have done by January 20th. So when I'm sworn in on the very first day, we could sign all three. Now, that would be real, and it would be practical. Hmm, I'm going to get that in just a second. In addition, in addition to the laws, there are a number of things you can do by executive order. We are developing an entire list of executive orders, all of which will be published by October 1st, so everybody will understand if you vote for me, this is what's going to happen. The very first executive order, all these will be signed on the day I'm sworn in. After about two hours after the inaugural address, we'll take, we'll stop and we'll just sign executive orders for a while. The very first one will abolish all of the White House czars as of that moment. I will also sign an executive order repealing all of the anti-religious bigotry in this administration. I will sign an ex... Huh? Lead us back to the Bible, Well, I think I, I, what I want to do, what I want to do is lead you back to the Declaration of Independence, which says we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable laws. If you, have, if you have an honest teaching of American history, you cannot explain America without the Declaration of Independence. And you cannot explain the Declaration of Independence without understanding that our founding fathers believed that these were truths. Remember, it starts, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Not principles, not ideology, not philosophy, truths that we're all created equal, which in 1776 was a very radical position. And it's one we didn't fully live up to at the time.
We had slavery. Women had a secondary role. But we have, for 230 years, been slowly and steadily reaching out to a point to live up to the ideal. It was the ideal that was so revolutionary. We then went on to say, we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. Now, this is really central to America. It's one of the things that Obama completely doesn't understand. The fact is that in America, we believe power comes from God to each one of you personally. You are personally sovereign. Because you are sovereign, you are a citizen. And as a citizen, you loan power to the government. The government never loans power to you. That's why the Constitution begins, we the people. Not we the politicians, not we the bureaucrats, not we the judges, we the people. Now, in that framework, and, and this is where the Obama administration's war on, on religion is so wrong. In that framework, we say these rights are unalienable. That means no government can come between you and God. That's the centerpiece of American religious liberty. We were founded by people fleeing religious persecution, and to have the Obama administration go down the road of that kind of behavior is exactly un-American and exactly a repudiation of the very reasons for founding the United States of America. Now, in that setting, <laughs> notice what they say. Among these rights are life, <coughs> liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a very important distinction here. This is where I disagree with the left. You have the right to pursue happiness. Now, remember, in the 18th century, happiness meant wisdom and virtue. It did not mean hedonism and acquisition. The Founding Fathers believed that a wise people could remain free, but a foolish people would end up in a dictatorship. But the right to pursue happiness implies pursuit, implies work, it implies activity. There's no guarantee of happiness, so there's no provision for happiness stamps for the under-happy. There's no provision for a federal department of happiness. And if you... If, and if, well, that's my whole point. I mean, this, this, is an this administration is so radically distinct from America that it really represents a fundamentally alien model. And Saul Alinsky, as, as the, you know, I believe in the Declaration of Independence. Obama believes in Saul Alinsky. It's a pretty big gap in terms of your sources. Uh, but think about it. If you, if you had said to the Founding Fathers, someday we'll have politicians who will come here and say, I'm going to take from the overly happy, and I'm going to redistribute to the underly happy. They would have said to you, what kind of arrogance is it that would lead somebody to believe that they have the wisdom to take from one American to give to another American? And where does it end? And so I think we're going to have a very clear choice this fall. President Obama clearly believes in a European model where you are merely subjects and the government is all powerful. He believes in the model where Washington knows everything and we, the American people, know nothing. So with your help, we're going to run a campaign that is going to surprise people. First of all, while I'm seeking to be the Republican candidate, I want to run a campaign this fall that's an American campaign, open to every American. <laughs> We're going to draw very big choices. We're going to say, look, if you believe in the Declaration of Independence, that your rights come from your creator, we want your help. Now, if you believe in Alinsky and a European model, we understand you'll be with Obama. You tell us who you are. I believe in virtually every community and virtually every ethnic group in America, there's a massive majority that believes their rights come from God. Second, we're going to say to people, if you'd like your children and your grandchildren to have jobs and a paycheck, come work with us. If you think food stamps and a safety net which turns into a spider web which traps you in poverty and dependency is adequate, you should be with Obama. We want to turn that, that spider web into a springboard to give you a chance for every American to work, to have a job, to get a better job, to own the job. And finally, if you... That's exactly right. 
And finally, we believe that if you're in a situation where the world is dangerous, we have real enemies. They would like to kill us if they could. You had better have the best intelligence system in the world. You better have the best military in the world. You better have a State Department which actually represents American interest and American values and works with the intelligence community in the State Department. So we are for safety through strength. Obama is for weakness and appeasement. Everybody in America of every background who believes we are safer if America is stronger, you are with us. Now, I believe that with your help, we can win this fall an historic election, an election which the American people, having seen the two sides, consciously choose that they want to send a signal to Washington, to Columbus, Ohio, to City Hall, to the County Commission, to the school board, at every level, that the time has come to reassert the principles of America. The time has come to reassert the work ethic. The time has come to reassert strength as the basis of our foreign policy. And the time has come to have a president with the courage to be honest, both about who's trying to kill us, about the challenges we face, and about the fact that all of us are going to have to work together. I need your help. I need for you to go on Facebook, YouTube. We're pitting people power against money power. I, I, I will never match Governor Romney in the amount of money he can raise from Wall Street. But I can match the number of people who are going to go out. In fact, we will have far more people who will help us. So we need you on Facebook. We need you on Twitter. We need you on your email list. We need you to telephone. And I'm old-fashioned enough, we even need you to talk to people face-to-face. -face. <laughs> if you will help us, we're going to have – this can be a great primary. Remember, early voting has started. This is time, so we need votes early, and we need all of you to help all the way through the primary and then in the general election. We need your help because if we do it right, we're going to carry Ohio by a huge margin. We're going to, in fact, be in a great place to win the Senate, win the House, and starting on day one, dramatically change everything. Thank you very, very much. Let's go.